Can you all hear me? Hello and welcome to this installment of the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives First Friday series. I'm Carolyn Shankel, Rare Book Specialist and your guest host today. It is my joy to introduce you to two of my colleagues, Scott Henshaw and Kathleen McCarty-Smith. Scott Henshaw is a two-time graduate of UNCG and an archivist in the University Archives at Jackson Library. His main work in archives includes accessioning records from across campus and doing oral history interviews for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Scott is in his 23rd year working here at Jackson Library and is an avid Minerva fan. Scott will briefly discuss Minerva's connection to UNCG, including her earliest appearances, changes in her appearance through time, and thoughts on why she was chosen to represent the school from its very beginning. Kathleen McCarty-Smith is currently serving as interim head of the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives at UNC Greensboro. Smith is an assistant professor and until this appointment, served as instruction and outreach archivist. She earned both her bachelor's degrees in history and master's degree in art history from Louisiana State University. She also holds a master's degree in library and information studies from UNC Greensboro. Smith's research has involved the role of academic libraries in fostering lifelong learning, the mobilization of North Carolina's women's colleges during World War I, and the history of UNC Greensboro. Kathleen will take us on a journey through May Day traditions and events on campus from 1910 to 1952. And with that, it's my delight to turn it over to Scott. Okay, thanks so much for that, Carolyn. That was a great introduction. I appreciate that. Um, today is uh, graduation day here at UNCG. So I do wanna give a shout out to all the um, class of 2022. Um, They've been through a lot. They've had a few years of pandemic mixed in with their college experience. So I uh, just want to congratulate them on all their work before we move on. Um, and uh, just to make sure everybody can hear me okay, right? Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is Minerva at UNCG. Um, I'm going to talk to her, talk to you about her in the uh, up to 1963. Um, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, that's the time when men came to campus. Um, so I'm going to leave some Minerva discussion for another talk if if this goes okay and people want to hear me and. <laughs> talk about Minerva some more. Yes, Patrick, uh, men came and ruined everything he says in the chat, and I agree, it was terrible. Um, just to tell you sort of the major um, things I'm gonna talk about today. Um, first, we're gonna talk about when and how Minerva first got connected with UNCG, um, who we think chose Minerva uh, as a symbol for our school, um, why uh, Minerva was chosen and some aspects of her worship and how and why Minerva changed over time. And with that, let's go to the first slide. So this is kind of neat, I think, um, <laughs> being somebody interested in the history of our university. Uh, first of all, you should notice, of course, that uh, UNCG has gone through many name changes over time. And of course, the first name we had was the State Normal and Industrial School. And this is the oldest diploma we have um, in archives. There were, <clears throat> let's see, in 1893, we had uh, 10 graduates. And in 1894, that's the year of this diploma, I believe we had eight graduates. I have a picture coming up, we can count them in just a second. But if you'll notice the diploma here, a diploma and life license. So uh, things were a little bit different back then. <laughs> um, Yes, a license to live. It's a license, a life license to teach. And, and that'll make a little more sense when I show you the next slide. But um, 
you know, one of the main reasons McKeever started this school was to start a school for women to teach uh, all the um, North Carolinians at the time. Now, this is a time when illiteracy was very high in North Carolina. And so one of his strongest desires was to educate the people. And he thought one of the best ways to do that was to start a school, of course, to educate women who would further educate the rest of the population. So, <laughs> yeah, I love the comments. Yeah, to whom may, may concern. Um, so if you notice, uh, Minerva's right there on the seal. I think y'all can see my pointer. I've got a blown up version of it as well here on this side. We can take an even closer look because we want to see Minerva in all her glory. Oh, there it goes. Um, right there. So state normal and industrial school, North Carolina. And there she is, Minerva. Uh, a, a pretty good rendition of her, I think. I, I, I know probably most people yeah, a solid Minerva, Patrick. Very good. Um, I think most people have a uh, conception of Minerva. Um, she is very closely related to uh, Athena. Uh, by the time of about the second century BC, uh, Romans were <laughs> were uh, worshiping um, Minerva and Athena were pretty much interchangeable at that point. They did have differences before. And of course, Minerva had... Um, her original origins as a um, Etruscan god, right? So um, that's just a close-up look of the first one and a really nice look at Charles Duncan McKeever's uh, signature there on the earliest diploma that we have. That's really nice. I can't write that well, um, but it's really nice. So let's move on. Is that a daisy on her helmet? Ooh. Sorry, wait a minute. I don't think so, but let's look, let's look again. I don't want to take too much time. But... <clears throat> oh, here. Wow, Kathleen. That's very good. Maybe. I don't know. The daisy, of course, is also one of those, well, in terms of our school, ancient symbols. Uh, it dates back, I think, to 1893. Um, there are a couple of other old symbols. The bell, of course, was here, probably the oldest symbol. Um, and it was ringing today, I'm sure, at the commencement. So yeah, good eye. That might be might be a daisy. Very good. All right. So we have. I should have mentioned whose diploma that was that we just saw. That was um, Mary Lewis Harris. And on the left, in this, this is the graduating class of 1894, and I believe that this person here is uh, Mary Lewis Harris. You can see on the right here, we have the graduating class of 1894 with the names. And also an important thing to note, there's certificates of the normal department. Of course, normal meaning uh, a teaching school, right? So there were different degrees and certificates and so on handed out in those early days before, um, you know, bachelors and things like that. Um, it took them a while to get to get going at that level. Uh, so small numbers in the graduating classes, a variety of um, different types of certificates and diplomas that you could get. So we saw one diploma there. And here is a, cer a certificate for uh, Mary Dale. I believe I'm saying that correctly. Um, this is also from 1894. So these are the two oldest examples of Minerva, Minerva um, swag that we have. Um, we can take a closer look at this one. And this would have been a, a, a license for five years to teach for five years. Now remember the diploma um, was, was a, a life license. So this was a cert certificate for five years and then you know they would have to, 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 to re-up their certification or whatever. But we can take a closer look at Minerva. Now this is an imprint. The other one was printed. This is like you stamp your book from the library of that kind of thing. So it's not as obvious, and I really wish we had the stamp, but um, there she is again. So that's cool. And is it the same? I don't know. We're going to see some uh, variety in Minerva's faces, visages. I don't know uh, as we go through, and that'll be interesting to see. But yes, I think Kathleen might be onto something there. And um, these were given, uh, that certificate was given to us by one of the descendant, one of her descendants, 
And this is some of the photos of her out there saying it's nice to attach the people to the things um, so that we can see what she looked like there. Um, I think that's great. Those are great photos, but these are not, as far as I know, these are not from her time at, at uh, the school. And this gentleman, you may know, um, I started off by putting just the one on the left on there because that's kind of him in his younger days, but I didn't know if anybody would know who he was. <laughs> so I put the one on the right, which is closer to the, to the McKeever that we all know of. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he was he cut a nice figure, I thought, when he was young as well. Um, so I think I've answered the first question was, when did Minerva first show up? That was 1894 on that diploma and that certificate. Those are the only two that we have from that early time. And who chose Minerva? Obviously I'm giving it away here. Um, and we don't know for certain. Uh, there, fortunately, there's no <clears throat> paperwork that we have or anything like that that says, hey, you know, I think this would be a great thing to do. But uh, I do know uh, there, there is a, a note that exists in the, um, and the university seal subject file from Betty Carter, the old university archivist. Uh, and she, she thought McKeever was probably the most likeliest um, uh, person to, to come up with Minerva for the school. So <clears throat> that's, that's what I'm going with. And there are other reasons for that. Um, McKeever, uh, he of course uh, went to UNC Chapel Hill at the time and the requirements at that time were pretty stringent. Um, I think. Um, I looked back and saw that uh, English, geography, algebra, Latin and Greek were re all required before you even get to UNC, um, you know, to, to, to attend. And then, uh, let's see, uh, UNC actually prescribed English language, geography, algebra through equations of the second degree, Latin grammar, prose and composition, four books of Caesar, five books of Virgil's Aeneid or the equivalent in Ovid, Sallust or Cicero's orations and of Greek composition and grammar, four books, four books of Xenophon's Anabasis or memorabilia and two books of the Iliad. So that was what he had to do before he got to UNC. So, <laughs> so once he got there, he actually was a very good student. He entered uh, UNC in the fall of 1877 at age 16 and graduated in 1881. And uh, during that time, he was an excellent student. He excelled especially in classical languages, um, Greek and Latin. And indeed he won a medal in Greek, which we see here, the front on the left and the back on the right, you can see C.D. McKeever. And uh, he also won honors in Latin at UNC. So that, I think that's, you know, he had to learn about Ovid before he even got to UNC, then he earned honors and medals in Greek and Latin while he was there. I think it's safe to say that he would have known one of the major goddesses of the, you know, the Greek and, and Roman cultures. So that's a good indication. Um, I would have loved to have seen, again, I don't have hard proof of this or anything. I would have loved to have seen more uh, Proofs, maybe some of his notebooks. These are his notebooks from his time at UNC, uh, zoology and history of North Carolina. But we don't have anything that, from his Greek classes or Latin classes or anything like that. And I'm quickly running out of time. I should have known. Um, sorry, Kathleen. You can talk longer if you want to. <laughs> uh, so why Minerva? Minerva was a goddess of wisdom and strategy and crafts, teaching, music, healing, and war, not in the way Mars was a god of war, but more strategy and the thoughtfulness of war, this, you know, the more uh, cerebral part, not the blood and guts part. Um, Ovid calls Minerva a goddess of a thousand things. And um, what he focuses on, Ovid that is, uh, was wisdom and teaching aspects of her, her wor worship. And so I have a little quote here, which I'm not going to read. But one of the things I think is neat is that um, he highlights the way she was a teacher. So he says, now pray to Pallas. Now Pallas is another word for Minerva. I won't explain that today, but um, they use words interchangeably for the, for the gods. So he says, now pray to Pallas, boys and gentle girls. Those who honor her well will be learned. So 
She is a very appropriate goddess for a teaching school. Um, we'll look through these fairly quickly because I'm starting to get into Kathleen's time, but uh, for various reasons, there are multiple images of Minerva on the seals. Obviously, when the school name changed, uh, even here you see the first one's Normal Industrial School, and then we have Normal Industrial College, so that required a new uh, seal to be made. Uh, you can see even the faces change here, um, and they're going to change more later on. So let me go ahead to save time and skip ahead and show you. It gets crazier as time goes on. So this is early. The first one's like 1894 here, and then the last one's, you know, in like 1919 or something like that. Then we have the North Carolina College for Women. Uh, the name changed, and then we have, we have some... <laughs> Varying quality uh, Minervas here, uh, you know, and some of these are from different places. This is the first one's a diploma. Uh, some of these are from the from the official bulletin of the school. Um, you know, I don't know, <laughs> but they're all you know official publications uh, for the most part here. So say what you will about them, but they changed a lot and and some of that has to do with who made it what it was made for let's move on to the next this is when when it really gets wild uh, we're getting into the 40s up through the 60s um, you're getting all kinds of stuff here uh, this first one's a diploma this one's from a bulletin this was an official one as official as there was at the time uh, this very stylized very feminine one uh, from the pine needles yearbook uh, again, an, another very feminine one. Uh, this was a decal that was sold in the bookstore. This was a notepad from the bookstore, if I remember correctly. And this is the inside of uh, 1963. No, is it 63? I think it's 63 pine needles right here. Um, let's look a little closer, some of these. And you can see, you know, uh, varying qualities. Lots of people are making these. It's not formalized like officially, although this one is pretty official. This was during the consolidated era. Um, but a lot of these things are happening, particularly things like this. The Pine Needles was a uh, student run type of uh, committee oriented type of uh, publication. So with any, anything like that, there's turnover and they, you know, it kind of more closely follows the fashion of the time, I guess is what you might say. So. So that was a problem uh, when men came to campus in the fall of 63, right? Uh, some of these are very feminine, right? Um, I mean, Minerva's a woman, so that shouldn't be a problem. But uh, when men come to campus, that kind of screw in, screws up everything, right? Um, and it's decided that we have to have an official seal, a real official seal. We have to get all this chaos under control, right? And this is what we end up in end up with and this is the one we have today and it's a you know I guess your opinion may vary you may have liked some of those other ones more um, but this is what we have ended up with this is the official seal of the University of North Carolina Greensboro and this came out in the fall of 63 again not I mean this was <laughs> largely because of men coming to campus and we want to solidify this and you know make sure we we get rid of all that chaos um, so 1963, this happens, and then everybody on campus is supposed to be using this seal. There are no other seals, right? So then we have, oh no, oh, what year is this? 1973, the official commencement booklet here. We have a, that's not right, that's not it. Oh well. <laughs> So we, we still have some lying around that um, aren't official and still get used. I don't know, it happens. But uh, so, sorry, Kathleen, I talked a little bit over. Um, if we have questions, I'm happy to take them now or at the end, whatever is fine. If you have any in chat, um, I'm happy to take them. So I hope you enjoyed my very quick look. I may do another one if people like it, if they wanna hear more. I didn't talk at all about our statues or our new university logo that features Minerva. Um, but if people want to hear about that, we'll do. Um, we'll do that later. So thank you for listening to me ramble about one of my favorite things of UNCG.
Yay, part two. Okay. Let's see if I can share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see this one? Yay, okay, great. Okay, I'm going to have a peek at May Day. It seems like since this is the uh, month of May, it's a good idea. Okay, so of course the tradition of celebrating May Day can be traced back to the pre-Christian era when the first day of May marked the end of winter in Northern Europe. And um, part of these rituals were um, planting of new crops, gathering flowers, dancing around a tall pole, and the crowning of a May Queen. So let me go ahead. So between 1910 and the entry of the United States in World War I, um, Elizabethan May Day celebrations were very popular. And this was true, um, especially at women's colleges. And that was kind of up and down, especially the East Coast. So State Normal and Industrial College, which of course is now UNCG, um, was no exception to that. And we think that the first May Day celebration on campus was in 1904, which featured a musical program by the Boston Festival um, Orchestra. But we don't really see any kind of artifact from May Day until 1910. And this is all we have of it, which is on the screen right now. And it's this one page of a program. Um, and but but we don't have any other known photo of it and it explains that an event that is to honor the adelphian society so it's a mayday fete and it says that it's to honor the adelphian alums and uh, at the state normal on the 26th of may and what does it include it includes th exciting things like swedish twining the wreath um finnish binding the sheath Norwegian mountain marches and dances, floral peasant dances, and winding the maypole. So a lot of fun stuff going on at this May Day Fet. You see a list of dancers, and this was probably um, all kinds of things. Either that this could have been either the alumni, the actual Adelphian group literary society, or this could have been the Cornelian literary society um actually honoring the Adelphians there's really no way to know it but you know which which literary society it was but this is all we know of that very early um May Day so the next thing that we know is that it was the 1912 one and this is one of the very the two most elaborate May Days on our campus those were the 1912 and 1916 May Day pageants. And these were the most outstanding celebrations that we know occurred on campus with students, faculty, Curry training school students participating. So from the very earliest times on our campus, we had a practice school. Um, and the Curry building, which is about the first Curry building, which is about where the stone building is now, um, was one of our largest one. And this was a practice school which had K through 12 students um, that our that our our students here, our women students, could actually take um, pedagogy classes and then basically walk over and do their practice um, training. So it was a great setup, and um, that they had athletic fields right next to it, which was shared with the college, and that was called Curry Court, and that's where these big May Day festivals would be held. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. So that's where they were done. <clears throat> So anyway, um, they had a beautiful program, and that's what you see here on the left, Ye May Day Fet, State Normal College in 1912. And they had an amazing thing, I love, and, and we've got some great pictures of this 1912 year. You see over to the right from Midsummer Night Dream, this um, part of it, and this is inside um, this uh, May Day uh, little program. And you can see just how, elaborate these were and how many people um, that it took to 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 hold these um in these two years 1912 and 1916 
thousands of people came from um, Greensboro and there was actually parades held with floats that went down through Greensboro and came in and tickets were um, sold. You see the master of the pageant was Julius Faust who was the president of the college at the time. Director was Mary Settle Sharp. You had director of dancing, directors of music. It was quite a big deal. Student committees, um, there was a cast of thousands. And the committee on cast, the costumes was a big deal too. Matter of fact, there was a huge amount spent on costumes, including children's costumes. And remember the children would have been coming from this Curry school, K through 12 school. And they were very heavily involved as well. And there was, I mean, it went, even with ticket sales, it went heavily in debt. Um, there was also a lot of livestock involved. So they had cows, they had horses. So I don't know who was in charge of the livestock. Stock, but that was a big deal too. Um, so you can see on the right that there was a lot of um, just a lot of characters involved from milkmaids to peasants to characters from these different types of medieval um, stories. There was a lot. Did they have livestock on campus? They had not at this time. Um, the farm would have already been moved out. They may have taken some some cows. They would have brought in some cows from our dairy, but there was a lot of horses too. And horses that would have been pulling the floats. And so I'm not sure who would have just been um, you know, kind of running the livestock situation here, but it was a cast of thousands. Um, so this is also in the program and it was showed you, showing you exactly what time all of this would have been taking place. So there would have been tableau, there would have been little skits, and this would have taken up, taken place all, you know, all kind of throughout the campus. Um, Plays like St. George and the Dragon, um, Yield English Games and Songs, Robin Hood, um, Plays of St. George, all different things all throughout the campus. And then finally, dances, chimney sweeps, um, all different kinds of dancing. Um, and then you see over here, so a lot of things going on at the same time, including singing and dancing. This is still 1912. So on the left, you see this big athletic field being used um, as kind of the culmination of what was going on. So this, for those of y'all who are familiar with the campus, this would be where the Petty Building is now. You know how the Petty Building looks like it was kind of built in, on, in a ditch? Well, it was built in a ditch. That's where the old athletic field was. And instead of filling it in, they just kind of built it down kind of where that was. If you see the tennis court in the back, that's where the Mary Faust dormitory is now, just to give you an idea of what was going on. That's where they culminated. And if you see those poles, those were the maypoles poles with the ribbons around them. And on the right, where they would have taken the ribbons down and they would have had a large maypole dance with colored ribbons and the students all dancing around the maypoles. Okay, and here is just one of the plays that would have happened. This is probably in Peabody Park. And Peabody Park took up probably originally about a third of the campus or a fourth of the campus. And this is now, there's a little bit of forest um, and it's kind of where the, for example, the new music building would be today. <clears throat> that was quite a bit of parkland at the time. And this would have been Robin Hood. And here you see some of the horses where the merry men are, are seated. Okay, on the left is one of my very favorite. If I had been in this play, I would have definitely wanted the part of the dragon in St. George and the Dragon. Okay, this is my favorite. We have several pictures of this um, where you have the, this, this one girl with the, um, with the hat and the others dressed up with the hats and the outfits with the stars and the moons. Um, there's quite a few more dressed like this with their brooms. Um, now, what, let me just ask the audience, what do you think these look like to y'all? Anybody in the chat? Yeah, you think? We've always thought these look like witches, but apparently someone got a hold of these folks and said, yeah, no, we're not gonna let y'all call these witches. So they are called now, um chimney sweeps so yes these were the chimney sweeps and they get around too yes i have no idea why they're on leashes okay not yet that went so well and was so popular they had another very large one in in 1916 um and this was the program all hand painted they're beautiful um you see the one this one on the front is featuring saint george and the dragon um, another Ye May Day Fete. 
State Normal and uh, State Normal College, um, 1916. Um, and you can see when you turn the front page, it's got a little poem with this great border. Um, again, with the, um, the times of when things are gonna be happening around campus. And a lot of the pages are, uh, have featured some of the characters. So photographs within the program and some great little drawings of fairies. This one also has a great map of the parade route. So you have an idea, they're coming through town, they're hitting the campus, they're going around, which is kind of behind Spencer dorm. This is College Avenue. They're going behind Spencer dorm, then they're going, then they're going in front of Spencer dorm, all the way around down College Avenue, in front of what was then the student building, down almost to um, Wooden Dormitory, which is now about where the Alumni House is now. They're turning in front of what was the now, then the main building and it's now Faust building all the way around down where the auditorium is now. They're passing down what was Walker all the way around into where it says Curry Court, but it's now kind of around um, where the stone building is now and they're ending up right where that big old athletic field is. And to the right, that's where the tennis courts are, where Mary Faust is right now. And they're finishing there where the maypoles would have been waiting for them and all of the floats would have stopped. So this is a really great that they included this um, <clears throat> in the program. So we now can see actually how it would have gone where they would have paraded through the school. And in the picture to the left, you can see this is College Avenue where they would have been parading and you can see some of the characters. This would have been the milkmaids and where um, that would have kind of been a natural, you know, kind of a natural place for the audience to see. And so people, again, thousands of people would have come not only from Greensboro, but said that they, have, they would have come from different places in North Carolina as well. So this would have been very well publicized. And on the right, you can see one of the horse drawn, drawn um, floats. So the floats were a very big deal too. And the students, not only from um, the state normal, but also um, the smaller students from the Curry School would have been included on the floats as well with different themes. And here are some of them as well. So presumably the one on the left might have been something to do maybe with fall, because um, you see like the little sheaths of grain and some of our students there with flowers. I was trying to figure out so once these horses started pulling them, they had to have been bolted on there somewhere or there would have been all kinds of accidents waiting to happen. And on the right, maybe this is more like spring. So all these great horse drawn floats through part of the city and part of the, um, the campus. And here's some more. I love this to the left. I'm gonna see if I can do Scott's fancy thing where I blow some of this up. This is frightening. Um, this is obviously a little float with some of the younger children on it. Maybe one of the teachers from the Scurry, Curry School. And I don't know if these children are duck, have duck face masks on or what, but these are really frightening. Oops. Okay, and to the left, this also shows um, some of the dancers. So the dancing was very popular. They had a lot of people dress up as different characters. Some of them um, were kind of associated with medieval stories. Some didn't seem to have any kind of um, connection with it at all, but they were just a great excuse to have different kind of dancers throughout the campus. Here's some other topics. I think this had to do with Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay, this was a great opportunity to also advertise these. They had colorized um, common commemorative postcards that were given out. And here's some great examples to give you an idea of how these were, um, how colorful this pageant would have actually been. Old English um, beef eaters to the right, and on the left, milkmaids. Heralds, and these little uh, spring and summer pixies to the right which would have shown you how the um, younger Curry school children would have been dressed up. This is the very back of the program. 
Okay, well, what happened to stop this very, very elaborate pageantry? Well, April 6, 1917, World War One breaks out. And I'm sure a lot of that very, very elaborate, expensive celebratory pageantry just seemed very, um, very trite. So we see those elaborate um, World War, you know, those very, very elaborate May Days really stop not only at UNCG, but throughout um, really throughout the, the East Coast. We don't see that kind of things, but that does not mean that they did not stop forever. They continued on and would kind of pick up again really uh, in the 20s. This is from 1929. We see um, a more of a May Day court start with less uh, pageantry and more of, again, kind of a court celebrating May itself, um, but there's still some um, programming. You see um, not anything as spectacular as um, the, the little program that we saw, but they still have some kind of a Maypole kind of thing going on and, um, and some, some programming that we see to the right. That's of the corresponding year. This is from 1933, a very, frank, a very, very um, simple program to the left. And we see the court to the right with very fashionable hats. It almost looks like a bride and her um, attendants. And that's um, a very nice fountain that they're standing in front of with still probably some of those K through 12 children accompanying them. Some of the programming I found from the 30s you see, they're still still bringing in a little bit of that, of that old English tradition. Um, I especially like the one in the middle. This is from 1938. And I thought it was interesting also that they've included at the back of it a, a Middle English song, kind of a traditional song, Sumer, um, Sumer es Ekumen in. Um, they, they include the first uh, stanza of that, which is a very traditional song and kind of a really cool little woodcut in the middle. Okay, well, some of you may know that we actually, in our artifact collection, have uh, a May Day crown. This is our first May Day crown, and it was given in 1940 to Virginia Ambrose, our May Day queen. It's one of my very favorite artifacts. I do love it so. And um, so what we have going on is still the continuation of the May Day court. Some slight dancing programming, but nothing like those early years. And um, she was one of the first to wear this May Day crown. And and at this point, they are picking a Mayday queen who has got usually like a, a stellar student. So, um, and Virginia Ambrose certainly was. Yes, you would have to, be, to beat me to get to the crown. So there's our crown. There's our crown queen. <clears throat> and we're still doing the Mayday court. There she is. There's Virginia and her Mayday court. You may um, recognize that she is in Faust Park and um, with her attendance. Okay, um, so we, uh, we only have one May Day dress in our textile collection and here it is. And um, there she is, um, actually our student um, who is wearing it, whose name is Elena. And you may see that this is her picture in the pine needles, but this is the actual picture of the dress. It is altered. Sadly, um, well, but not sadly, because she was able to keep it and wear it for different things. We do not think she wore it as a wedding dress, but someone in her family did. So we have it, but it looks a bit different from the way Elena wore it um, at, at her May Day crowning. In 1950s, the May Day looked quite different. Um, the court got a bit smaller and it did um, have to compete with other things that were going on in the school. Um, so here you see two pictures. Um, on the right is the last picture we have of May Day. Um, it got less and less popular and because of the expense and again, the competition with other things going on at the end of the year, um, the last May Day celebration, which was sponsored by the senior class, was finally held in actually 1954. Um, as I said, because it was so close to commencement, consumed so much energy, money, and time, the senior class voted to abolish the tradition. Okay, and that's all I have. Well, thank you, Kathleen and Scott. This has been just a wonderful um, presentation. We did have one question in the chat. Um, 
that when you showed, Kathleen, when you showed the image that had the fountain, was that the fountain that was formerly in front of the Faust building? I don't think that was the fountain. Um, the fountain, that fountain does not look like anything that was there in front of the Faust building. So I suspect that that was another fountain. I've thought about that and I've got fountains that compare with that. And I do not, I mean, I've got pictures of the fountain that was there, but it does not look the same unless they snuck another one in there while we weren't looking. I suspect that that may have been another fountain. Okay, thank you. And Scott, you've got a message um, question in here that thanks you um, about the, your presentation and wanted to know is Minerva a personal favorite goddess and what drew you to researching her history at UNCG? Oh, thanks, uh, Jessica. Um, so a little bit background about me. I, my undergraduate degree is actually in Greek um, from UNCG. I uh, also took Latin here as well. So I was pretty familiar with, you know, Greek and Roman mythology. And uh, she's an appealing goddess, you know, she has a lot of uh, many, many attributes. Um, and I think she is well suited to the university. So when I working in archives, I found I kept seeing differences in, in these <laughs> images of Minerva. And that was one of the things that sort of made me to, uh, especially during the uh, 125th anniversary when we were doing getting a lot of requests for things, uh, images. Um, you know, I just kept digging and digging and finding more and more. And so I've just researched and researched and researched something that I love. And it's been a great op opportunity too. And we should be the UNCG owls. I just saw that from Aaron. Uh, that would be fantastic. The owl is a um, often associated with Athena. Uh, so, and, and so Minerva as well. And somebody wanted to know, um, who was do you know who was doing those designs of the Minerva logos? Uh, so a lot of those are committee work, I think. I, I, don't, I don't have um, proof of that, but, you know, things like the yearbooks were done by committees. So um, we do have class rings changed a lot as well. We might can look at some of those in the future if people are interested in that. We have some class rings, but um, those things changed with as the committees changed is what I, is what I think happened. Students, you know, graduate and move on and then a new group of students come in and for whatever reason, they change it slightly or they change it radically. Kathleen, do you know if classes were canceled for the May Day um, events? I would think that, especially in the early days, I mean, those were a cast of thousands, but I, I would think that they would have been, sure. Maybe not toward the end, but I would think, especially in the early days, they would have been. Okay. I have a question for Kathleen, if there's not another one. No, you go right ahead. Uh, so Kathleen, can you tell us uh, how you knew the dress that had been altered? How did you match it up to the person? Did the donor tell you? Is that how it happened or? No, we just looked, we looked at the older, we, we couldn't figure out what was going on until we, we actually looked at it in the old yearbooks. And then we realized that it had been altered because we couldn't figure it out. We we're like, we know it's from this person, but it doesn't look at all like this dress. Right. And then we just okay. took it and we just kind of, we literally matched up and we're like, yeah, it does look like the old dress, but it, it was, it was altered. And then we, we kind of, tracked it down we asked around and we're like it was it, it had been used for other things so we're like yes it was the same dress but it had been used and we're like we will still take it but we'll just of course mention that it had been altered it was well loved it was very well loved and used afterwards but that was the 1940 dress right so uh, it was 19 that one was that one was not um virginia ambrose's that was elena i forgot her last name but that one was um, a little bit later. That was 1947, I believe. Okay. I didn't know if any of the rationing during the World War II would have affected maybe the reuse. It, it was a big old beautiful satin dress and <laughs> someone used it again. All right. All right. I don't see any other unanswered questions in the chat. If anyone has one, please pop it in there. Give a moment. But if there are no other questions, oh, we're getting lots and lots of thanks and lots of love for the presentation. And I want to thank you as well. This has been fantastic. Yeah, thanks everybody who, who came to listen to me ramble about Minerva.
And Thank y'all for coming. Listen to a much better talk from Kathleen about No, Monday. Scott's is always <laughs> wonderful. We want a part two, Scott, part two. We'll, we'll see. We'll maybe, uh, you know, we'll see what the reviews are like on Yelp. Five out of five stars. <laughs> Who knows? We insist on a part two. Thank y'all. Take care. Thank you. Bye.